to our fifth lecture on Fourier methods in combinatorial number theory. So my name is Sean Prenderville. Um, just so you're aware, this is being recorded. Um, so I hope that doesn't inhibit questions and it'd be great if people feel free to, to ask questions as they've done in, in previous weeks. So just unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one or you can use the raise your hand feature or you can put a question in the chat. But I might not see the chat whilst I'm speaking. If anyone's got any accessibility issues with the notes or the videos or the slides, do let me know and we'll try and resolve those so you can email me. The notes are available in the YouTube description um, for this video or uh, they're linked to in the, the weekly email that I send around for this. So I think that's all the admin covered and I'll just um, get on with today's content. So today the, the moral is we're going to talk about what happens when you struggle to use Holder's inequality? Holder's inequality has been very useful for us in the first um, four lectures of this course. What do we do when Holder or the naive application of Holder's inequality doesn't seem to work? So first we'll talk about um, when Fourier analysis doesn't seem to work. And what I mean by that is when Holder's inequality doesn't seem to work because the methods we're going to employ to overcome that obstacle are still Fourier analytic. So instead of using the L infinity Fourier norm, which is this norm which has come up again and again uh, in previous weeks, which says that if you're counting solutions to an equation, um, that count is controlled by the largest Fourier coefficient of, of the weights you're employing. We're going to control those weights with Gower's norms. So we'll introduce what they are and give you a, a little bit of a sense of what they measure. Now, these are tools from higher order Fourier analysis, but for the application I've got in mind this week, although we go via the formalism of Gower's norms, we're eventually going to show that most Gower's norms don't matter, and the only Gower's norms we have to worry about for the application in question is essentially the L infinity Fourier norm. So we're back to where we started. Okay, so here's the application I've got in mind. It's a theorem of Borgan and Chang, and it concerns subsets of a finite field with p elements where p is a prime. So imagine we've got a denser, a set of density delta. And what Borgan and Chang show is that you can obtain an asymptotic formula for the number of configurations of this form in that set. So it looks like a three term progression, x, x plus y. And instead of x plus two y for the final term, we're going to square the y variable. So it's a non-linear version of a three term progression. That's why I've called this a non-linear Roth configuration. And Borgan and Chang's asymptotic is um, essentially the naive heuristic. And we get the same number of configurations as you'd expect in a random set of density delta. So just to say this was probably known to Furstenberg and Weiss already, but the power in what um, Borgan and Chang prove is they obtain a very effective error term, essentially a power saving in the prime P. Okay, and as a corollary, what you deduce is if, if your set lacks non-trivial configurations of the form, non-trivial means that the common difference Y is non-zero, then you conclude that your set has to be sparse because dense sets definitely contain this configuration because of this asymptotic. And in fact, if you have got an effective error term like this, you can show that sets lacking this configuration are, are polynomially sparse. They have a power saving in terms of their, their cardinality compared to the size of the finite field. So we're not going to follow Borgan and Chang's proof. We're going to follow a proof of Pelouz, which generalizes to these longer polynomial progressions in finite fields. Now Pelouz has two proofs of this result, actually. We're following her second proof. And the second proof generalizes. And just to say that the proof also delivers a power saving in the error term, probably not comparable to this power saving. I haven't bothered to work out and the error term, 
And but if you do, you'll you'll see it gives a, a power saving. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. And the reason I've chosen in this application is because it gives me a chance to, to talk about what you do when Holder's inequality doesn't work. And we can see a little bit of the machinery of Gower's norms without going too deep into the theory of Gower's norms. We don't require any um, inverse theorem for um, higher order Gower's norms. We're just gonna get away with using Fourier analysis. Okay. But why is free analysis sometimes um, insufficient for these kind of applications? So for the last four lectures, we've used again and again, a Fourier control type statement. And what that says is, if you've got some one bounded functions, then the counting operator associated with the configuration you're interested in, for example, three term progressions, if that counting operator is large, then that largeness of the counting operator is witnessed by each of the individual functions having a very large Fourier coefficient. The Fourier coefficient, which is a positive proportion of its maximum possible size. Okay. So how did we prove this kind of statement? This is um, what I say when I say we use orthogonality and Holder's inequality because we rewrote this count as a Fourier integral. We encoded three term progressions as solutions to a certain linear equation. And that has allowed, allowed us to write, well, a rescaled version of this counting operator as a, well, I'm working in a finite field, aren't I? So a Fourier integral, integral over all possible frequencies um, Fourier transform of my first function, Fourier transform of my second function, Fourier transform of my third function. Okay, and this is because um, three term progressions correspond to solutions to the equation x0 minus 2x1 plus x2 is equal to zero. So we could use orthogonality and where does Holder's inequality come in? Well, we just hit this this integral with Holder's inequality and extract a, a large Fourier coefficient of one function and an L2 norm of the other two functions. And you can bound these L2 norms using Parseval's identity and you deduce that this Fourier coefficient has to be large. So. We've used this again and again. That's great. But there are configurations where this doesn't work. So for four term progressions, you can come up with functions which have very small Fourier coefficients. The Fourier coefficients um, are much smaller than the, the maximum possible size. They decay as the length of the interval increases. And yet, the number of four term progressions weighted by these functions is the largest it could be. So what do these functions look like? They're very simple. They're just quadratic phases. I'm just recalling the notation, my notation for phases here. And what are we doing? We're exploiting the fact that there's a, a linear relation um, amongst the squares of the linear forms defining four term progressions. So here's the, the relation, you can check it if you want. And because these um, phases are um, homomorphisms, you can pick up this linear equation when you integrate and you always get one. So you can't hope for this kind of Fourier control type statement for four term progressions. Okay, but where does our method see this? Where does our orthogonality plus holder argument see this? Where does it break down? Well, you can definitely encode a four term progression, the counting operator as a Fourier integral. It's some two dimensional Fourier integral. And you extract a large Fourier coefficient and you're left with a two dimensional Fourier integral. 
And we know that the number of four term progressions is approximately P squared. And the Fourier transform is approximately size P with our normalization. So in order to conclude there's a large Fourier coefficient, we need this two dimensional Fourier integral here to be of size at most P. Okay. But Parseval says that on average, the Fourier coefficients of a bounded function um, are around size square root of P on average. Okay. So what that means is each function here contributes approximately P to the half. So we get P to the three over two, which is too large. So essentially you can't hope for this exponential sum or this free integral to have enough cancellation in order to get Holder's inequality to work. And the fact that this could never, never work is witnessed by the, the counter example we saw on the previous slide. And something similar happens when you think about these nonlinear configurations. And really the reason with these nonlinear conf configurations is because there's cross terms when you try and write things down in terms of an equation. So you can encode this counting operator for this nonlinear Roth configuration, some Fourier integral. Don't worry too much about the form of the Fourier integral. You extract a large Fourier coefficient and you're left with trying to show that this integral here is approximately of size P. Okay, so you need this, this exponential sum here to ha have square root cancellation on average. And you might hope to do that if these um, combinatorial weights didn't exist, but they do exist. So you have to deal with that. And um, my understanding of the Borgan and Chang approach is that they do deal with these combinatorial weights and show that this thing has square root cancellation on average. But you can't just naively apply Holder's inequality or Parseval to show that this has square root cancellation. So you have to do something else. So what the something else that we're going to do is we're going to replace this um, L infinity Fourier norm with a different norm. And the norm is going to be a Gower's uniformity norm. So these were introduced by Gowers in his proof of um, Samaradi's theorem, his effective proof of Samaradi's theorem. And they're necessary because we've seen that for four term progressions, free analysis is insufficient. So what do they look like? So here's an auxiliary definition. It's a difference function. It's, you can think of this as a discrete derivative and defined multiplicatively. Okay. And you can iterate this uh, multiplicative difference operator. And the degree S Gower's norm is essentially the sum of this iterated different difference function when we're averaging over all possible difference parameters. So as I've written things here, it's not even apparent that this is, um, it's not apparent this is a norm. It's not apparent that this expression inside the brackets is a non-negative real number. And you can show both of those things. So it does turn out to be a norm provided S is at least two. They're, they're elementary arguments, let's not worry about them too much. Um, if S is one, we don't get a norm, we get a semi-norm. But actually most of the arguments we employ don't care whether we're working with a norm or a semi-norm. Um, and just to say that the U1 norm, it's informative to know that the U1 norm is just the sum of your function in absolute value. Okay. So it's a little hard to pass this expression when you first see it, but let's, it's perhaps more instructive to think about what it measures. So the U2 norm is a norm we've essentially already met it's the L infinity Fourier norm up to some um, 
polynomial dependencies. So the L infinity Fourier norm, if it's large, then the U2 norm is large. This is for a bounded function. And if the U2 norm is large, then the L infinity Fourier norm is large. So for bounded functions, the U2 norm is essentially the same as the L infinity Fourier norm. Well, that's useful when you want to know what the U3 norm measures. So the U2 norm, I'm sort of going to use these two expressions interchangeably, these two norms. So what does the U3 norm measure? Well, using this definition of the Gauss norm, you can see that the eighth power of the U3 norm is just an average of the U2 norm of the difference function. Okay. And if the U2 norm measures the largest Fourier coefficient, then the U3 norm measures the largest Fourier coefficient of the difference function on average, okay? So if the U3 norm is large, then there are many difference functions which have a large Fourier coefficient. And if there are many, if many difference functions with a large Fourier coefficient, then the U3 norm is large. So don't worry, even though we've gone to U3 norm, we've still got Fourier analysis. Now the U3 norm is definitely um, captures different information to the U2 norm because there are examples of functions which have um, maximal U3 norm, one bounded functions with maximal U3 norm, but whose U2 norm decays. And they're the quadratic phases that we've already met. And in fact, you can show that if the U3 norm is large, then in some sense, your, your function has to resemble a generalization of a quadratic phase, a so-called two-step null sequence. We don't need to know what a two-step null sequence is. Um, a heuristic to have in your head is a two-step null sequence is sort of like a quadratic phase. Okay, so we know when the U3 norm is large, it measures correlation with these things that look like quadratic phases. Now let's show our counting operator is controlled by the U3 norm. So we're given some one bounded functions and we assume our counting operator is a positive proportion of its maximum possible size. And then we're going to conclude that the U3 norm is large. There are many difference functions with a large Fourier coefficient. So why that's useful is if you want to um, attack this counting operator, for instance, if your functions are indicator functions of a dense set and you want to obtain an asymptotic for this counting operator. This configuration control statement says you only have to worry about um, functions which have large U3 norm because functions with small U3 norm don't contribute significantly to this counting operator. Okay, and then you might employ the inverse theorem for the U3 norm which says functions with large U3 norm look like quadratic phases in some sense. So just as with regularity, regularity allowed us to reduce checking a, a combinatorial problem to checking it for a Bohr translate. This kind of U3 control statement, you might hope would reduce um, analyzing this counting operator to analyzing the counting operator for two-step null sequences. Okay. But we're not going to do that because we, we don't want to um, get into the kind of deep, deeper issues to do with two-step null sequences or the inverse theorem for the U3 norm. Because our counting operator has some very nice sort of mixing properties, we can bootstrap this U3 control statement to a U2 control statement. And in fact, once we've controlled this counting operator by some norm, some uniformity norm, we're going to run a degree lowering procedure, which shows actually these more general kind of quadratic phases don't really contribute much to this count. In fact, the only quadratic phases which contribute to the count are the linear phases. And um, so if a function has large count, then it's got a large Fourier coefficient. Okay, that's sort of degree lowering, going from U3 control to U2 control. You might then think, well, if you can lower degrees, why can't you lower the degree of the U2 norm to a U1 norm? And indeed you can. So we'll eventually show that 
if you've got some bounded functions, counting operator is large. The only way that can happen is if one of the functions has a large average value. Okay. And so this is a very simple statement and it's very useful because it's so simple, but something can go wrong. You could have um, the largeness here being, being too large. So the reason I mentioned this is if your function um, has average value equal to zero, then this statement certainly can't hold. So we must be in this situation. So we've shown that if um, one of your functions has average value zero, then the counting operator is very small. It's some power saving in P. Okay. So that's just a reinterpretation of, of, or a consequence of this U1 control state. So that's particularly useful when we come to prove this asymptotic for the nonlinear Roth configuration. So we've got our count of our configurations within a dense set of integers, not integers, a dense set in our finite field. Let's decompose our indicator function in terms of its density delta plus the balance function one minus delta. So we'll substitute this decomposition here for our third function. Okay, and by linear arity, we get two counting operators, one involving the density delta, one involving the balance function. Now the balance function has average value zero. So from what we've just said, this term is very small because of this U1 control statement. In fact, it's a power saving. So we might hope this is a main term. And indeed a, a quick change of variables, if you rewrite a new variable Y tilde as X plus Y, you get a sum over X and a sum over Y tilde and the two the sort of counting operator involving the two functions separates into an average over two functions. And these averages are just the density of our set A. Okay. So using this U1 control statement, we've got our asymptotic formula with a power saving error term. Okay. So hopefully I've demonstrated the utility of these kind of um, configuration control statements. So what remains to show is establish that we can control our configuration by a U3 norm. And then once we've shown that, do this degree lowering process where we show that U3 control implies U2 control and U2 control implies U1 control. So that's what we're gonna do for the rest of the lecture. So U3 control, how do we establish U3 control? There's gonna be two steps to this. The first is um, we're going to linearize our configuration to look like something like a four term progression. And then we're going to do um, what's sometimes called in the literature, a generalized von Neumann theorem, which shows that a linear configuration is controlled by a Gower's norm. So let's start with linearization. So the ergodic theorists call this um, pet induction or polynomial exhaustion technique, or maybe polynomial ergodic theory but I think of it as linearization. You take some one bounded functions and your counting operator associated to your nonlinear configuration is a positive proportion of its maximum possible size. Now here I've got a two point nonlinear configuration just because I want to um, illustrate ideas before moving on to our nonlinear non -linear Roth configuration. And the conclusion is you can upgrade your nonlinear counting operator to a linear counting operator, okay? So if you've got some one bounded function, which has a large nonlinear count, then your one bounded function has a large linear count for some one bounded function G and for some non-zero constant C. So there exists some non-zero constant C 
and some one bounded function G, which gives you a large linear counting operator. So how does this go? So as with every single proof in this lecture, it's um, a few applications of the cauchy schwarz inequality. So we square our nonlinear counting operator, okay? And this thing inside here is um, at most an expectation over X and we can bound the F zero function by one. And then in absolute value, we've got the expectation over Y of F one of X plus Y squared. Okay, and we're squaring all of that. So we can apply the cauchy schwarz inequality and you get, you can take the square on the inside to the absolute value. Then we expand this square to get two sums over y. So we double the y variables. We get a sum over x, y and y tilde. And we get our first function, our second function f1 and the conjugate of our second function f1. Just simple Cauchy Schwarz. Okay, and now we're going to change variables in x and define a new variable x tilde to be x plus y squared. And given that change of variables, our first argument becomes x and our second argument becomes x plus y tilde squared minus y squared. And now we want to use the difference of two squares formula that you probably learned in school. So to do that, we're going to reparameterize y tilde as y plus h. So now we're summing over x, y, and h. Let's employ the difference of two squares formula. And it looks now like we've linearized with respect to y. So from y's perspective, we've got a linear configuration, x, x plus something times y. From the h perspective, we've got a nonlinear average, but we could think of h as a, as a constant. It's just some random element of our field. Okay, so we're almost in this situation. Apart from the fact that, I mean, if we just apply the pigeonhole principle now, we don't obtain some h for which we've got a large linear counting operator. But h might be zero. So we need to rule out the possibility that 2h is equal to zero. And we can do that by um, just restricting all h to be non zero at the cost of some error term, which is negligible. It decays with the size of the field. And now we imply the pigeonhole principle, take a maximum over all the possible h's. And we've obtained our, our function g1 is just f1 x plus h squared conjugated. So this is the g1 that appears in this average here. And our constant c1 is just two times h. Okay, so that's the possibly the easiest uh, instance of um, Pett's induction. And just to say that this two point linear average, you can actually perform a change of variables, maybe write um, y as I don't know, one over ci, we're in a field, so we can invert elements, invert non-zero elements, y tilde minus x. Performing that kind of change of variables, these two sums over x and y separate, and you can bound the sum involving g trivially, and you just get the average value of, of fi. So actually this, this PET induction 101 shows that these two point nonlinear configurations are controlled by the U1 norm. Okay. But we don't have a two point nonlinear configuration. We've got a three point nonlinear configuration. So things are a little harder. So when we apply the PET induction procedure, which is just Cauchy Schwartz again and again and again, until you've sort of knocked out all nonlinear terms by um, essentially differentiating. If you think about our use of the difference of two squares formula, we were kind of differentiating the quadratic term. Differentiating linearizes nonlinear things. So we do that enough times and we control this 
three point nonlinear configuration by a four point linear um, counting operator. Okay. So when we start with two point nonlinear configuration, then we ended up with a two point linear configuration, and that's a very fortuitous situation. And in general, for a general polynomial progression, um, the number of terms in, in the linear resulting linear configuration grows extremely largely as the extremely largely it goes extremely fast as the complexity of the polynomial progression increases. So if you have a cube here, um, I can't remember how many points are in your linear configuration, but it's a lot. And um, yeah. So there's a price to pay for linearizing and it's that you increase the number of points in your, in your configuration. But just to emphasize that this four point configuration sort of looks like a four term progression. If, um, if CI was equal to I, then we'd have a four term progression. Okay, we'd have the counting operator of a four term progression. So we can actually guarantee that all of these CIs are distinct, that's important, and they're all non zero. And um, the functions which come out in our linear counting operator are all one bounded. Okay, so linear, nonlinear to linear, but you might increase the number of points in your configuration. So that's the first step in showing that our configuration is controlled by the U3 norm. Now we've got to show that the linear counting operator is controlled by the U3 norm. And this is um, an argument that goes back to Gowers and proved in its most general form by Green and Tau. They call it a generalized von Neumann theorem. Again, it's essentially the Cauchy-Schwarz um, inequality applied many times. So let's see it in a simple instance. If we've got some one bounded functions, or one one bounded function, and it counts many four term progressions, then you can con con conclude that you count many three term progressions. So this is great, right? Because four term progressions, we know Fourier analysis doesn't work. Three term progressions, we can attack that with Fourier analysis. What's the price we have to pay for reducing the complexity of our linear configuration from four points to three points? We have to replace our original functions by their difference function on average. Okay. But this is good because we know how to control the counting operator for three-term progressions by the largest Fourier coefficient. So you can employ that argument. It's again, it's orthogonality plus Holder's inequality. And your conclusion is, if you've got lots of four-term progressions, then you've got lots of large Fourier coefficients as you average over balanced functions, no, difference functions, not balanced functions, okay? And this is essentially saying that the U3 norm of our function f is large. So how does this go? Again, you square your counting operator and we're going to, just as we did before, we're going to double the y variables and sort of crash through with absolute values to sort of forget about the first occurrence of our function f. So using the Cauchy-Schwarz um, inequality, just as we did on the previous slide, we double the y variables. And now we're going to do this procedure of um, reparameterizing and changing variables. So let's relabel the y tildes as y plus h. Okay. And now we're going to change variables and introduce a new variable x tilde is equal to x plus y. How does that change our operator? We now get x, x plus y, x plus 2y in the first three functions. That resembles a three term progression. In the next three functions, we have the similar three term progression. And you can pair off these functions. They both have x in them. This one both has x plus y in them. And this one, they both have x plus 2y in them. But the second function always has some shift by a h. You can sort of see if you pair functions off in this way, we're looking at a balanced function. Oh, I keep saying balanced function, a difference function. So let's employ that observation. 
we've got a, a count of three term progressions weighted by difference functions. Okay, so we've got our conclusion here. And it was just the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. So four term progressions are controlled by the U3 norm. So let's up the complexity of this a little bit and let's look at the situation we encountered after we applied PET induction. We had a four point um, linear counting operator with some one bounded functions and some distinct non zero coefficients CI. And the same Cauchy Schwartz argument goes through, and you can conclude that. Um, whichever function is your favorite here, it has a large U3 norm. Okay. So how do we get this U3 control statement? We've got some one bounded functions and we've got lots of nonlinear Roth configurations. And we conclude that whichever our favorite function is, we've got a large U3 norm. How does the proof of that go? We just hit this operator with pet induction to obtain a large linear count. And then we hit the linear count with this Gower's differencing procedure to obtain a large U3 norm. So we've shown U3 control. Okay, so we've accomplished the first component of our strategy, which was controlling our counting operator by a Gower's norm. It turns out it's the U3 norm is the one that we got. And now I claim that actually we can upgrade that to the U2 norm and then upgrade that further to the U1 norm. And that's this degree lowering procedure, which doesn't work for four term progressions, I have to say. But it does work for this nonlinear configuration because it's um, somehow more mixing. So in the chat, Ali asks Can that procedure be iterated to reduce a three point configuration to a two, two point one? Yep, it can. So if you've got a three point a configuration, you can reduce it to a two point linear configuration. Again, you introduce another difference and another difference function. So in essence, you have a twofold iterated difference function instead of a one fold iterated difference function. And essentially that just gives you uh, the U2, the U3 norm. So there's nothing extra to be gained from doing it one more time. It gives you what you would get if you were, if you hit the, the three point configuration with Fourier analysis. But it does it all in physical space as opposed to Fourier space. Okay, so now we want to do some degree lowering. So the way I'm going to lower degrees is um is to use some machinery, um which in the literature it's called dual functions. And a dual function is a structured object, which encapsulates some of the mixing properties of your configuration. And that's going to be useful to us because we want to exploit these mixing properties. So what I want to show you is, I'll introduce what a dual function is shortly, but imagine we've got this situation where our counting operator is controlled by some norm. I'm going to show that the, if the counting operator is large, then a dual function also has a large norm. So what's a dual function? The dual function for this counting operator corresponding to the function F0 is capital F0. And it's just the counting operator um, with X fixed and forgetting about F0. So one way to think about this is um, the counting operator up to normalization is the inner product of F0 with its dual, okay? Which I guess is where the name comes from. Okay, so that's a dual function. And I claim that if we've got one of these configuration control type statements, then the counting operator being large implies that the dual function has a large norm, okay? Now, if this was the, um, if the norm was the L infinity Fourier norm, then we'd know that the dual function had a large Fourier coefficient. That means that the dual function up to normalizations 
there is some frequency such that when we average um, elements from our field, the dual function has large correlation with this phase. Okay, now you expand the notion of the, the definition of the dual function, and this is just our counting operator with the first function replaced with a, a phase, a linear phase. Okay. So if you've got a nice inverse theorem for your norm, if you can show that your norm being large implies correlation with some structured object, for instance, a linear phase, then these dual functions allow you to go from large counting operator with some combinatorial weights to a large counting operator where the, one of the combinatorial weights has been replaced by a very structured function, a, stru a, a function coming from your inverse theorem. And you might hope you have more chance of analyzing this counting operator because you can exploit these, the structure of, the, of the, the linear phase in this case or whatever structured function you get. So that's why dual functions are useful. useful. Okay, but how do you go from this configuration control statement to um, showing the dual function has large norm? Again, it's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So what do we do? We square our counting operator. We know this is large. So we square the counting operator. It doubles the y variables. And you can see that if you take this expectation over y tilde, on the inside, you've essentially got a dual function. Okay, weighting the x variable. So a little thought will show this doubled count where you doubled the y variables is equal to the counting operator where the first function is a dual function. And now you apply your configuration control statement because the dual function is definitely one bounded because of its definition. So we've got a large counting operator where the first function is the dual function, so the dual function has a large norm because it control, that norm controls our counting operator. Okay. So how do we lower degrees using these dual functions? This is just a reminder of what a dual function is. So imagine we've got an inverse theorem. If we know our norm is large, for some one bounded function f, then there's some structured function psi such that f correlates with psi. We apply that inverse theorem to a dual function and we get that our dual function correlates with psi. So we've replaced um, the first function in our counting operator by a structured function. So psi might be a two step null sequence, it might be a quadratic phase, it might be a linear phase. But what we're going to show is, we're going to show, imagine this is a, uh, a two-step null sequence. We'll show it can't be a very complicated two-step null sequence. In fact, it, it's got to be such a simple two-step null sequence, it's going to be a linear phase. And then we'll show actually that linear phase is so simple, it's going to be a constant function. So if the U3 norm of the dual is large, we've got correlation with a two-step null sequence. We'll show that implies correlation with a linear phase with the dual, and that in turn implies correlation with a constant. And why is the dual um, having large U1 norm, why is that useful? Well, it essentially reduces the number of points in our nonlinear Ross configuration by one. Because if you look at the U1 norm of the dual, it's equal to one of these two point nonlinear counts. And Maybe you've done enough work where you know how to attack um, nonlinear configurations with less terms in them. And indeed, we did this in lecture one, in the notes for lecture one. So we know how to obtain asymptotics and, and configuration control type statements for these simpler two point nonlinear configurations. So we've, re we've reduced our nonlinear Roth configuration three points to a simpler two point configuration because the dual norm has large U1 norm. Okay. 
So for instance, you can conclude that maybe F1 has a large U1 norm using this pet, pet induction 101 argument we've already seen today. And this was the final sort of U1 control statement we were hoping for in order to prove the Borgan Chang theorem. So let me sketch how this degree lowering procedure goes. And I'm going to do it, I'm going to show U2 control implies U1 control because it's technically simpler than, simpler than U3 control implies U2 control. But essentially, almost every idea is the same, apart from one extra idea, but we don't need to go into that. So here's our dual function. Let's suppose our dual function has a large U2 norm, i.e. it's got a large Fourier coefficient. And we're going to conclude um, that this dual function has a large U1 norm. So let's rewrite what this statement means. We expand the dual function and we get that our counting operator is large where the first term is a linear phase. Now we need to exploit the properties of the linear phase. So we're going to redistribute the phase because it, a phase is a homomorphism. We're going to redistribute the phase to get something which sort of looks like a counting operator for a diagonal equation. When we've got diagonal equations, we've got convolution and we hope to get this kind of Holder type argument to work. So Holder's, the orthogonality plus um, Holder's inequality comes to the rescue eventually. Okay, so we distribute phases. We want to make the argument in our phase resemble the argument in our F1 function. We can do that if we introduce a cost of a new phase determined by Y. Let's package up this function as just a one bounded function, G1. So again, we've got a new counting operator for a three point configuration, but this three point configuration is encoded by a diagonal Diophantine equation. You can check that. So now we've got orthogonality and Holder's inequality. Let's rewrite this as a Fourier integral with some Fourier transforms of our weights. And this is the, the Fourier, well, it's the correct thing to detect solutions to this equation. But you can think of this as just an exponential sum. Let's extract a large um, value of this exponential sum using the usual um, Holder plus orthogonality argument. You get an L2 norm of the first two Fourier transforms and the L infinity norm of the exponential sum. The L2 norms you can bound in terms of Parseval. So in conclusion, we've shown that this exponential sum is large for some B. It's a positive proportion of its maximum possible size, which is P. But Weyl's inequality shows that um, this exponential sum the only way it can be that large is if B is equal to zero, the frequency corresponding to the quadratic term, and if the frequency corresponding to the linear term is also zero. So if the only way this inequality can hold is if B is equal to zero and A plus B is equal to zero, then we can conclude that this A frequency has to be zero. So let's backtrack to this expression. That tells us the trivial Fourier coefficient of our dual is large. But the trivial Fourier coefficient in absolute value, it's just the U1 norm. So we've got the statement we wanted. The U1 norm of the dual is large. And then you can, from that you can, just as we showed on the previous slide, you can show that the U1 norm of one of your constituent functions, F1 or F2 is large. That gives us our U1 control Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for today. So next time, it's our last lecture, and we're going to exhibit this technique of energy increment by proving the arithmetic regularity lemma. So the, we've seen one example of application of the arithmetic regularity lemma. It's a very robust um, technique. It can yield lots of results in combinatorial number theory. And we're going to um, demonstrate it's proof using this technique of energy increment, which is related to density increment that we've already seen. But there's no further application. So there's no sort of result in pure combinatorial number theory we're going to prove next time. But I just want to highlight the fact that, that 
if you can prove the arithmetic regularity lemma, then you can prove lots of results in combinatorial number theory. But we won't see any of the concrete applications. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for today. I'm going to end the stream and end the recording.